Hello everyone, welcome back to another video here at the Intent Hockey Channel. Today is where we've got another off-season preview video here to discuss. Looking at the next two teams who've been eliminated. That is the Arizona Coyotes and the Seattle Kraken. We'll go through what led to them being eliminated from playoff contention. We'll go through the pending UO phase, pending R phase, and draft capital for this upcoming season. And we'll also be looking at uh, what I think they can do in the off-season to improve and potentially make the playoffs next year. We'll get to all that coming up right now. Hello everyone, welcome back to another video here at the Internet Hockey Channel. Before we begin this video, don't forget to like this video and subscribe down below. Thank you all for your support. I'm able to with all of you guys, so if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe button down below. And don't forget to leave a comment down in the comment section below so I can discuss today's video. Now, as we did in the past couple of days, we, I posted my videos on Chicago and San Jose, looking at how they did, uh, looking forward to the offseason. Same thing with Columbus and Anaheim, and now we're looking at Arizona and Seattle. These were the fifth and sixth teams eliminated from playoff contention this year. Arizona being the fifth, Seattle being the sixth and there were the fourth and fifth teams in the Western Conference that were eliminated. So those are the next teams we're going to be doing here. So let's we'll start with the Arizona Coyotes. Now, going into the season, I had high hopes for the Coyotes. I mean, they did start to veer away from the rebuilding sort of path. They went out, they used draft capital to acquire Sean Dursey. They signed free agents such as Jason Zucker, Matt Dumba. It looks like they were trying to become a little bit more competitive this year. And to start the season, they were. You go back to January 22nd, so just a couple of months ago, the Coyotes were in a really tight race for a playoff spot. They were two points back in the National Predators for the final wildcard spot in the uh, Western Conference. Four games above 500 at the 45 game mark. They were actually looking pretty good. But since then, they've absolutely collapsed. I mean, I think there's something like 10, 20, and 2 or something. I mean, they've been absolutely awful since then. They had I think it was like a long 13, 14 game losing streak that really kicked it off. Ever since that losing streak, they were never able to overcome it. They've had a couple of good games since then. But still, I mean, that really derailed their season. They're having a really good season. At the beginning, the first half of the season, the Coyotes were a really good team. And it looks like they had a really a lot of promise to potentially being in a, at least a playoff race this year. But that second half collapse was a major reason as to why the Coyotes were one of the first teams eliminating the Western Conference and the NHL. Uh, the bad defense. Uh, the defense wasn't overly bad this year and not as bad as it was in recent years. I mean, I think the goaltenders in Ingram and Rich Melka have covered up a lot of the problems on their blue line. But they had a lot of a younger blue line with guys like Dursey, Moser, uh, a couple of other guys who were more of young younger defensemen who are on that team, so you can see they're going to make a little bit of mistakes. They're also 8th lowest in the NHL in goals against right now, so they're not an overly great team, but they're also not one of the worst teams, so still bottom 10 though, and I think the defense did have a, a huge problem with that. Another thing was, they're still a younger team. As much as this was supposed to be a more competitive year, a uh, year where they grow a little bit, they still have a lot of extremely young pieces. I mean, Logan Cooley uh, got his first NHL season this year, uh, Moser's only in his, I think, second or third NHL season, uh, Jersey's still quite a young player. Keller's still a pretty young player. On top of that, Dylan Gunther's been a really good piece for them when they call him up. He's a younger player, so there's a lot of young pieces on this team, so they're about to make some mistakes. This was not a team who was guaranteed to make the playoffs, and I don't think there was even any guarantees that there would be a competitive team, but they were supposed to do a little bit better than last year, and right now they're on a similar path, so I think the reasons that they're not doing a lot better than last year was facts that the second half collapse, the thing that really just killed that Arizona Coyotes team. Uh, the bad defense where it hasn't been overly great this year and the young team in front of them was probably the three reasons as to why this Coyotes team did not do overly well this year were the three reasons as to why this Coyotes team didn't do overly well this year now if you look at uh, their pending UFAs and RFAs for a second coming season as well as their draft capital if you look at their pending UFAs there's only four guys on the UFA list who are really of any significance you have uh, forwards Travis Boyd and Liam O'Brien uh, both of them decent Boyd had eight points in 16 games before being injured has been injured for the rest of the season. He's actually been a pretty good pickup. I will not be surprised if the Coyotes look to try and bring him back maybe for one more season. Liam O'Brien's been a really good bomb. 6 forward, has 12 points in 69 games. Not that overly bad. He's a really good fourth line uh, enforcer, but not sure if he'll be back or not. On the defensive end, you have Travis Dermott, who has 7 points in 49 games, and Josh Brown, who has 8 points in 45 games. Both are decent 6th, 7th defensemen, but I'm not sure if either one of those guys will be back, so I'll be interested to see, but those are the pending UFAs that the Coyotes have right now. If you look at their list of RFAs, you do have a lot of them. Now, there's not a lot of high-end level RFAs, especially on the forward group, but they do have a decent amount of RFAs. On the forward group, you have Barrett Hayden, who's probably their biggest 
just a forward RFA. At some point in the third of games, he's been injured for quite some time. Uh, so he's basically been a scratch for the past little while. So he, I think, could still potentially be traded. I wouldn't rule out that fact, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he was back with the Coyotes next year. So I'll have to wait and see on that. And then you also have a couple of other RFAs who are less likely to be either uh, extended to a long-term mega deals. Uh, you got Milos Kellerman, you have John Leonard, you have Nathan Smith, and you have uh, Jan Jenik, who are all decent players, have had NHL experience in the past, uh, but they haven't been consistent in NHLers. There's Jared Kellerman's playing 10 games, Leonard's playing 6, Jenik's playing 1, Smith hasn't played an NHL game, but they're all really good potential guys who could be at least like bomb 6-4s at NHL level, so I wouldn't be overly surprised if they were brought back, but I also wouldn't be overly surprised if they were let go. On the defensive group, you do have a handful of guys. Uh, you have a couple of lower-end guys, like Kolo Shionok and uh, Soderstrom, who are more RFA guys this year, but I think we would still have uh, futures with that organization, so I'll have to see on those guys. But the bigger ones were Moser, Kesselring, Valimaki, and Dursey. Valimaki's been a really good player, has 16 points, 63 games, a really good top four defense, and I expect him to get an extension. Uh, Moser's been a really good player, has 26 points, 75 games, and only been able to stay healthy, but has been a really good top for the fence. I expect him to get signed. Uh, Sean Dursey at 37 points in 71 games. It's been extraordinarily well with the Coyotes as a top pair of the fencemen, so I expect him to be signed. Uh, you got Michael Kesselring, who has five goals, 13 assists, and 18 points in uh, 60 games. He's actually been a really good find for the Arizona Coyotes, so I expect him to get signed. So, a long list of RFAs here for the Arizona Coyotes, but I expect most of these guys to wind up re-signing with the Coyotes. Uh, if you look at the current draft capital for this Coyotes, uh, in 2024, they have 13 picks, which is more than any of the other guys I'm pretty sure they've gone over so far. Uh, they have one first round pick, which is their own. They have three second round picks, which is theirs, the Capitals, and the Panthers. They have three third round picks, which is their own, the Oilers, and the Avalanche. They have theirs and the Sharks fourth, their own fifth, their and the Stars sixth, and their own seventh. So they have a ton of draft capital for this upcoming season. I mean, I don't think any other team has more draft capital than the Coyotes for this upcoming season, so they could go a lot of ways with all the picks they have. They'll probably keep their own first rounder but besides that I could see them definitely trade some picks to try and improve their team or they could potentially trade some picks to move up and get players they want so it'll be interesting to see what they do but they have a ton of draft capital and a lot of abilities here to go in the offseason to try and improve this team now if I look at five ways in my opinion that I can see this Arizona Coyotes team improving this year uh, first they need to figure out the future of this team off the ice I mean this team looks to be hanging in the right direction on the ice I know they had a really sour stretch in the second half of the year but they look like they're building something really good and special in Arizona, I think they will be a playoff team in a couple of years' time, but they got to figure out, are they going to be in Arizona long-term? I mean, there's a lot of talk about that uh, Arizona arena getting built, uh, they're going to win the auction in June, hopefully they do, but if they don't, this could be a very good likelihood here that the Coyotes will not be in Arizona at the very least beyond next season, so uh, it really does depend. The future of this team is the major concern this offseason, and I think uh, signing players, uh, keeping players in Arizona, that's going to be a huge huge problem if they don't know where their long-term future is. So that's probably the biggest priority there for the Coyotes this offseason is to figure out, can they stay in Arizona or should they be able to relocate? We have to figure that out. On top of that, I talked about this in videos before, I expect them to use their draft capital to add more young players. We saw them do this last year. They had Montreal's second round pick last year, moved it to LA in order to get Sean Dursey. It worked out fantastically for him. He's been a fantastic top four defenseman. I expect them to do some sort of similar things, whether it be to try and add a forward, like a guy like Cap or Drury from the uh, Rangers or the Hurricanes or try and add like a defense like a Nils Lundqvist from Dallas or Nick Hague from Vegas or I'm not exactly sure who they would try and target but I will expect them to try and move draft capital and get some players who are in a tough tight uh, cap situation with some other teams so I expect them to definitely try and do that uh, if you look at their blue line I think they need to rework their blue line sign their RFA so as we just talked about Velimaki, Kesselring, Dursey, uh, Moser I expect all four of those guys to be back they need to be signed not sure how long term they willing to go, but I expect all those guys to be back at the very least on one-year deals for the Coyotes, and then they also don't have a whole bunch of really great blue liners in the prospect uh, pool, plus I don't know if Lamaru or Simashev are going to be ready for the NHL next year, so I would expect the Coyotes to try and bring in some more top four defense like they did this year with Dumba, so I would expect them to definitely be in the market for adding some blue liners, not sure if they'd be willing to overpay some of the uh, older blue liners, or if they're going to go for trying to add like a solid top four defense, I'm not exactly sure which way 
they're going to go, but I definitely expect the Coyotes to be looking to add some defenders to try and rework that blue line. I also expect them to consider moving guys like Vegmelka, uh, Bugstead, Kerfoot, and Schmalz. Schmalz has two years left. He's a really good top six forward. I've seen his name pop up in trade rumors. I would not be overly shocked if the Coyotes traded him. On top of that, Kerfoot, Bugstead, Vegmelka will all be entering the final year of their deals. So if there's no real future for the Coyotes, they could hold on to him and deal him at the deadline, but I also wouldn't be overly surprised if they dealt them in the offseason. So that's another thing we'll have to watch out for. And on top of that, they need to add more veterans. I mean, there's a, a lot of really good players on the Coyotes, but this is a younger team. So adding some more veterans to get some more leadership established in that room, I think it would be a fantastic thing for Coyotes. And like I said, they need to try and get a long-term plan in place to see if they remain in Arizona or go somewhere else. But I definitely do think this team needs some veteran leadership. So that's sort of why I see for the Arizona Coyotes. Those are three reasons why I think that they missed the playoffs. Those are the UFAs, RFAs, and draft capital for them this upcoming season. And those are the five ways I can see them improve in the offseason to try and become a better team for this upcoming season. Uh, going over to the Seattle Kraken. Now, they were a team who was in there for quite some time. They started out absolutely awful. Uh, I think they were the, only the second team besides San Jose who started a season off without winning a game. Like, they were the second longest team. So they had an awful start. They had to work their way back up. At one point, they had a nine-game winning streak, a 14-game point streak, and were able to get a couple games above 500, but they were never able to keep up that pace. And they did wind up falling below 500 again. Right now, they're hovering right around 500 uh, at this point in time. I mean, the three reasons why I think the Kraken missed the playoffs. Uh, one was the really bad start. I mean, they were below 500, I think, for the first 25, 30 games. And usually, teams who are below 500 at like the 20 game mark don't make the playoffs a whole bunch. So, I wasn't expecting the Kraken to be overly competitive. I mean, I'm surprised they were able to get a close as they did. And they were able to make it interesting, but they were never able to really get into the playoffs. So, uh, that's probably one of the reasons why. On top of this, it's their third year. I mean, they overachieved last year. They had a really good season last year. A, a lot of people were surprised by how well they did last year. But this is still an expansion team. Uh, this is only their third year, so they missed the first year. They make it to the second round in uh, year two. And now they miss in year three, so I don't think this is overly surprising either. Uh, the offensive decline, they had a ton of players have career seasons last year on the offensive side of things. This year has been a little bit of a drop-off for all those players. They also lost a guy like Daniel Sprong, who's been a fantastic player last year for the Kraken. They also lost a couple of other bomb six forwards in the uh, free agency, so they did lose a little bit of their scoring. Uh, guys like McCann, uh, Schwartz, uh, Eberle, uh, Tolvanen, they're not having as good of seasons as they did last year, so it definitely does hurt them a little bit too. So given that how well they did offensively last year, I mean, if you look at their team right now, they're bottom five in scoring as of according to this video, uh, only ahead of the Ducks, Sharks, and Hawks. So they're not having an overly great season scoring goals, and they're probably going to finish in the bottom five scoring after having a really good scoring season last year. So that's another reason why I think the Kraken did not do overly well this year. And the third one was Grubauer's play. I mean, he's been injured a little bit, so you got to give him a little bit of leeway. But ever since arriving in Seattle, Grubauer's not looked overly good and this year is not any different. He has a below 900 save percentage of losing records so Grubauer's play has definitely hurt the Kraken and I think is another reason as to why the Kraken why not missing the playoffs this year. So in my opinion them not only overachieving last year but also having a slow start this year was a, a key piece as to why they missed the playoffs. On top of having a little bit of a down year offensively and Grubauer not having an overly great season those were probably the most pressing reasons in my opinion as to why they did not do overly well and making the playoffs this year. Now if we look at the teams pinning UFA's pinning RFAs and draft capital for this upcoming season. Uh, if you look at the printing UFAs, they have a couple, but not a whole bunch that are overwhelmingly going to be huge, either subtractions or keeping. Uh, if you look at the four group, they have Devin Shore, John Hayden, uh, Max McCormick, who've all been really good call-up options, but are not NHL level forwards consistently at this point in time. So I could see him stay, but I could also see him leave. Uh, you got Pierre with Belmont, who's actually worked really good as like a bomb six forward. I'm not sure if he'll be back with the Kraken next year or not, but he's been a decent fourth line center. So I wonder if he gets brought back. Thomas Shatari, who has actually been really well as like a top nine forward after being acquired in season has eight goals 14 assists 22 points in 67 games this year has actually done quite well after being acquired by the Seattle Kraken so I do wonder if he gets brought back but those are your forward RFAs you also have Justin Schultz on defense event who's been a decent third pair defenseman so I could see him be brought back but wouldn't be overly surprised if he wasn't and you also have Chris Trigger who's been a really good third string goaltender it was one of their expansion picks but I'm not sure if he'll be re-signed by a Kraken either so those are some interesting ones I have to look at their pending RFAs they only have five really significant RFAs. You have Luke Hemman, who was the first guy signed by a Seattle Kraken, who was one of the free agents. Uh, I would expect him to potentially be back on like a one-year cheap deal. Uh, you got Cole Lind, who was the expansion pick from Vancouver. I could definitely see him be brought back by the Seattle Kraken. Then you also have Kyler Yamamoto, who was brought in on a one-year deal last year. Done all right, has 15 points in 56 games. I could see him be brought back. I have Eli Tolvin, who's had another fantastic season, picking up 
41 points in 76 games. That's actually worked out really well as like a top six forward there. So I could definitely see him be brought back by Seattle. And then you have Matty Benier. So definitely having a down year, having 14 goals and 34 points in 71 games. But I do think he has a future as being a solid first line center for a Seattle Kraken. So I would expect him to definitely be re-signed too. So also interesting uh, RFAs for the upcoming season for the Kraken. And then if you look at their draft capital, they have nine picks for this upcoming draft, which is not overly bad. They have more than they were originally uh, scheduled to have. They have their own first round pick. Theirs in the Rangers second. Theirs in the Leafs third. They have their fourth. They have no fifth, but they do have their sixth. And then theirs in the Flames seventh. So they have an extra seventh, third, and second. So that's very good stuff there for the Kraken if they want to try and make some moves before a draft. So really good stuff there for their draft capital. And then look at how they can improve this team in the offseason. First, I would have to say that they should definitely allow Wright to play in the NHL. He's been called up recently. Actually looked fantastic. So I think they can have Wright as like a consistent top nine forward in the Seattle Kraken organizations, like a second or third line center. I think that would be fantastic fantastic for the Kraken, so having Wright be a more consistent NHL player next year I think will be a huge win for them. Uh, on top of that, I think they need to add a top six goal scorer. I think after the season they had this year, uh, they need to show that they need to have a solid goal scorer. I mean, McCann's a really good player. They do have a couple of really good uh, forwards on that team, but they don't have a real lethal goal scoring finisher, so I think they definitely need to try and go out and get a goal scorer. I mean, they have a lot of draft capital. They have a couple of really good prospects, so I could definitely see them try and put together a package to try and go for one, or if they're looking at free agent market, try and go after a guy like Jonathan Marshall who's having a good season. I think they could be a really good fit for Jay Gensler if he doesn't stay in Carolina, so I think they could definitely go after a couple of guys in free agency too, so we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens there for Seattle. But I definitely do think this team really needs to figure out a way to get some more solid level goal scoring in that team. Uh, I think they need to do something with their goals. I the Cord came in this year uh, when Grubauer was injured sort of started to become the starter, and he's actually looked fantastic. The Cord's been a fantastic goaltender. Now, I'm not sure if he's ready to be a starter, but he can easily be a 1B and work in his in tandem. So I definitely think they need to keep the cord. But Grubauer, like I said, ever since signing in Seattle has not worked out overly well. So I think they need to move Grubauer, try and find a new home for him, and then bring in a new goaltender, whether it be a more 1A goaltender, potentially in free agency, like a Capo Kakunin, or another goaltender like that, Cam Talbot. Or they need to try and go out and get uh, started. We talked about how guys like Saro, Skips, and Markstrom could be available this year. So I think they're going to need to make some uh, moves to try and get a new starter. But we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens happens with the Seattle Kraken on the goaltending side, but I definitely think that's going to be a situation we have to watch out for. Next, they need to either move or re-sign Adam Larson. I mean, he's going to be entering the final year for his deal. He's a really good top for the fence and has worked out fantastic ever since coming over in the expansion draft from the Edmonton Oilers. He's been a very fantastic partner for Vince Dunn, so if they can re-sign him, I think they should definitely try and do so. He's been a really good top for a fenceman, like I said, but if they can't, I think they need to consider moving him because he's a really good piece and he could definitely bring them in a lot of value. So we'll have to wait and see on that, but I think they need to make a really good decision on Adam Larson. And lastly, you need to continue to add some more young pieces. I talked about Wright earlier, but I think they can add a couple more forward pieces that are on the younger side. If they can give Riker Evans on the defensive end like a more consistent initial role, I think they could be a really good piece there for the Seattle Kraken. So that's why I think for the Seattle Kraken, those are the three reasons why I think they wound up missing the playoffs this year. Those are the pending R phase, pending UO phase, and their draft capital for this upcoming offseason. And those are the five ways I can see this team improve in the offseason to try and become a better team. So that's all I'm going to talk about here today. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the crack and the coyotes down in the comment section below. Do you agree with my assessment of why they missed the playoffs? Five ways I can see improve in the offseason. And what do you think about their RFAs, UFAs, and draft capital for this upcoming season? Definitely love to hear your thoughts on all of that down in the comment section below. So I want to talk about for today. I'm going to try this video. And if you're like to subscribe down below. Thank you for your support. I never able to without you guys. So if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe button down below. Don't forget to leave a comment down in the comment section below. So that's how I'll discuss today's video. I also have a blog talking about news, rumors, analysis, stuff like that. So if you check that out, I'll go into that in the description below. And I can't wait to see you guys all for next video. See you guys soon.